when was the last part of this series? One month ago? Two months ago? Well, welcome back. I haven't forgotten it existed. This is Be With Me Forever. My fantasy AU epic, so to speak. I hope you enjoy it just like the previous parts. And if you are new here and haven't watched the other parts, the link to the playlist is down below. Um, probably in the pinned comment and the description. So both. So you have two options. Uh, if you are a returning viewer and you like this series, please remember to watch the video until the end. Like or dislike and comment something down below, because we want this video to appear in the YouTube algorithm, because when it appears in the YouTube algorithm, I get more views and I get more money and everybody is happy. Because numbers. Numbers are important. Remember that. Please, I'm begging you, do that. Like, seriously. I'm getting desperate. Anyways, I hope you enjoy this part just as much as you did the previous ones. This story took me admittedly five hours to write, so I hope it was worth it. Please, enjoy the show. Bakugo had become bored. The Red King had been using the wooden toys the necromancers used during training for way too long. His axe had become dull, and the mock battles with the admittedly worthless opponents that were the mages. And the mock battles with the admittedly worthless opponents in the form of the mages were uninteresting. Worst of all was the lack of any advancements the mages made in battle. They truly were nothing but nerds. If he wanted a real training session, he would need to acquire real tools of war and order a group of zombies to kill him. This opened up the problem, though. The foundry of the tower was the domain of a man he deeply, deeply disliked. Iza, the Lord Necromancer of the Mechanicus. The few times the two men interacted with each other, always ended in Bakugo being more disgusted with the scholar. With sorrow-filled eyes, the blonde looked at his dull and useless battle axe. His thumb slid across the edge, the blade unable to even slice through his first layer of skin. It was an embarrassment. If any of his fellow barbarians saw it, they would kick him in the stomach and force him to craft an entirely new weapon as punishment. He sighed, finally having given up. The tower's foundry, while not the heart of the tower, it clearly made up its brawn. A gigantic factory located on multiple separate floors, pipes leading from it Pipes leading from its ever-burning furnaces went throughout the tower, giving it the necessary heat. The top floor of the factory was situated right under the pleasure baths of Oleg, to ensure the right level of temperature for the man's meditation. Sometimes Bakugo wondered why the necromancers even needed the city of Almajik. The tower had everything a city needed for self-sufficiency. Then again, maybe that was the reason anyone so rarely left the tower. How the cult of the emissary managed to be so close to the people they thought to be gods, yet so far away and still praised them almost every minute of their existence, was a mystery to him. With a yawn, Bakugo entered the lobby of the tower. As he tried to remember the proper teleportation code for the foundry. As per usual, the hall was empty save for a few skeletal guards, and a man in Rex sitting on a stone bench near the entrance. His entire body was twitching, and he was desperately chewing on his fingers. Was he a ghoul? Slowly the Red King approached, until the man noticed him coming closer. Almost immediately, he jumped off the bench, falling to his knees. Ah, 
You must be one of the saints, he shouted, his voice echoing through the hall. I have come here to report, yes, uh, I've seen something. Uh, who are you? asked Bakugo in confusion. The man now fell forward onto the ground. Uh, don't bother with my name, yes, uh, as it is not important, your grace and might. Bakugo blushed, more of second at embarrassment than anything else. Are you an emissary? Truthfully, Bakugo had never met one of the cultists, and maybe now he knew why they were generally avoided. The grey rags had holes all over them, and covered the entire body of the man except for his arms. He was thin, almost skeletal, like an animal close to starvation. His skin loose and leathery, his spindly fingers were covered in a thick layer of dried blood, yet somehow he managed to not smell overly disgusting. Finally, the man looked up at him. His eyes were bloodshot and heavily dilated, his teeth sharpened, and what little of his tongue the barbarian could see was covered in scars. Bakugo took a disgusted step back. He felt pity, but was too horrified by the man's appearance to act properly. I'm stationed in the outpost, yes? Red Sun Outpost! Uh, came as fast as I could. I saw them! Yes, I saw them with my own eyes! The man now fell back onto the ground, rubbing his face into the floor. There weren't many. Bakugo sighed. What did you see? The elves! They're coming! He inhaled hastily. <laughs> they wear lethric arms, armed to the teeth. I warned as many as I could. A pit opened in Bakugo's stomach. Had he taken too much time in marrying you? And now the three kingdoms thought he was in danger and this was a rescue attempt? Or worse? Bakugo shook his head. No, that couldn't be. They would definitely have tried to send him a letter or something. My dear saint, what do we helpless wretches do in this time of need? Bakugo shrugged. We are like with the free kingdoms. I highly doubt it's, you know, an attack. The twitching man below him squeaked. Then I apologize for the misunderstanding, master! He cried. N no, I... I mean, it's fine. Uh, also, he had to come clean. I'm not a necromancer. I'm Bakugatsuki, the Red King, leader of the Fire Tribes, etc., etc. <gasps> Future husband of the goddess of magic, he shouted. I'm nothing compared to your excellency. I didn't know. Please forgive me. Uh, it's fine. Uh, maybe a different approach to the situation was required. Uh, I, uh, I order you to eat something and go back to your post. The pitiful man in front of the barbarian risked another look. Yes, thank you, my lord. Before quickly scuttling to the gate. Watching after him, Bakugo blew up his cheeks. This was information he should definitely give to someone. Adding another reason to the pile to not further slow down meeting either you or Izar. After an hour of trying random teleportation codes he vaguely remembered, he finally stepped foot into the foundry. His jaw dropped almost immediately. He found himself in a gigantic hall filled with people and ghouls, hammering at metal, maintaining machinery, 
Some were even singing. And finally understood why everyone was so proud of Izar. If he had built all this with his men. Bakugo walked past a few blue-roped men. In awe to all the moving and steaming machinery. How was he going to find Izar in all this? Should he just give his weapon to a random ghoul? Like a headless chicken, he stumbled through the workshop and he found himself in front of a large sliding gate. There stood a big portable throne with the giant blob of meat that was Lord Oleg on top of it. The giant waved graciously towards Bargago as he noticed the barbarian approach. Ah, the rich king of the barbarians. I have just mentioned you, said Oleg as Izar revealed himself behind the monster. And Bakugo raised an eyebrow in surprise. Izar wasn't wearing his robes. He was wearing a stained white tank top, white brown leather pants, and his hands were covered by sturdy and heavy leather gloves. A pair of goggles hung on a strap around his neck. Up until now, Bakugo hasn't seen the mage's face, as it was always covered by the darkness of his hood. He looked very much like you. His hair was blonde and was right now bound in a short ponytail. His eyes were a glamorous purple. But most striking about the man's face was the red mark on his forehead in the shape of an eye. It was the symbol of heresy given by the mages of the Arcana Mariam. Isaac quickly looked away, trying to cover his right arm. He had a mage's arm. A sign of a true arcane master. Bakugo was one of the few who knew of this strange affliction. Apparently. The nature of a true sorcerer was revealed through the mutation their primary arm experienced. Izar's arm seemed to be made of ivory, with gentle, dimly blue glowing carvings all across it. Even a single white feather seemed to come out of his elbow. Izar, said Oleg quickly, as we talked about. I expect the first prototype to be finished before I pass away. I'd like to see the move at least once. Izar audibly gulped before Oleg slapped into his meaty hands, calling for his ghouls to carry him away. Before the giant was out of earshot, he quickly shouted towards Bakugo. When you are done here, look for my lovely granddaughter in the inner sanctum, will you, my boy? The barbarian was about to respond, but the giant was already gone. So, darling, what are you doing here? Said Izar with an embarrassed tone, still trying to hide his ivory arm. There are actually three reasons, said Bakugo. Three? shouted Izar. <laughs> we go from zero to three. How delightful. Bakugo shrugged. I mean, I guess. He really didn't want to bother with the mage. Izar smiled, finally having given up on fidgeting with his arm. May I inquire on that? The Red King sighed. My weapons are dull from training. And I'm really bored because of that. You offered me to visit you here a few weeks ago, so might as well. And uh, one of your cultists told me something one of your lords needs to hear as quickly as possible. Isa chuckled. <laughs> Glad to see this isn't a visit born out of politeness. That's what I admire about you barbarians. Always straight to the point. The necromancer blinked, which is usually straight through the heart, right? Bakugo growled awkwardly. He really disliked this guy. Can we please talk about my weapons? Izar sighed. Oh, fine, fine. Um, 
What are they made of? The axe is made out of silver wind silver. Really, really expensive. Family heirloom, in fact. Don't you dare lose it. And a black metal sword, two black metal daggers, and a black metal battle axe. With the exception of the silver hand axe, Bakugo simply dropped his belongings on the floor. Izar huffed, impressed upon picking up one of the daggers. Oh, it's been so long since the last time I had the opportunity to work black metal. He paused and then looked back at Bakugo. Uh, the silver axe you have to work yourself. Uh, my ghouls do the prep work and silver burns their skin. <laughs> I can go into detail on that if you want. The man shook his head. No, just... just repair them, okay? Isaac grinned before simply saying, Only if you do something for me in return. The necromancer gently placed the weapons on a nearby table before turning his attention to the barbarian. I would like to show you something. This earned him an embarrassed hiss from the Red King. I'm not into that. The mage blinked in confusion. What? Then his jaw dropped and he started to laugh hysterically. <laughs> Oh my, oh my, I know you don't like what I like, my king. No, 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 you are for my sister. No, I was simply talking about... Isa pointed behind himself. My wonderful machine. Despite all of Bakugo's mental attempts, this still sounded like an offer for something loot. After sighing in resignation, Iza quickly grabbed Bakugo's arm with his normal hand. And before Bakugo could protest, the necromancer began sprinting. Dragging his reluctant companion behind him through a side door into the room behind the big gate. The blonde barbarian was about to shout profanities at the mage, but quickly decided against it when he looked upon a gigantic machine. It was bigger than a house. Probably even bigger than one of those angel statues that decorated the borders of the Kingdom of Lyre. It was shaped like an empty knight's armor. Giant brass gears poked through the seams. The head akin to the helmet of a dwarven paladin. And his shoulders so heavily armored that probably not even an elven katana could slice through it. What is that? huffed Bakugo, more in horror than amazement. My sister has her grim bahirs and, well, I have my ironclad, said Iza with a cheeky grin. The two men approached the automaton. I designed it specifically to hunt down greater demons, and to be able to go toe-on-toe -toe with the demon lord himself. Mm -hmm. The ironclad should actually be slightly smaller than the demon lord himself. But, you know, physics. Can't make it any bigger than this. Isa blushed. Mm -hmm. Wanna know why I build it? I mean, yeah. You don't just build big metal things. The mage went quiet. He actually didn't expect Bakugo to take interest in his daily activities. Well, Isa took a step forward. Come, sit with me. With a bad feeling in his gut, Katsuki followed the man to a metal bench next to the ironclad and sat down next to him. Isa mournfully stared up at the machine. So far, he started, every Lord Necromancer of the Mechanicus has added to our arsenal. My predecessor, my father, created steam-powered presses. We use them to this day, in fact. In the foundry and the factories in Almagic, I mean. Isar looked down at his feet. 
I will leave behind the ironclad. A one-man machine. Um, a one-machine army. But it isn't working. Isar looked up and pointed towards a large metal tube that was hanging on a giant chain from the ceiling. These are my Worldbreaker guns. They're also not functional. The necromancer blinked. Uh, if you don't know, Worldbreaker guns are dwarven super weapons. Giant fortresses with the only goal to power and fire a singular artillery. No one but the dwarven engineers know how to make one. Well, sure, these cannons aren't even half the size of a real Worldbreaker gun. I want the mechanism to be the same, so they can be just as devastating as the real thing. I want my ironclads to defeat the Demon Lord in a fair battle. Cementing us humans and our technology to be what I... Cementing us humans and our technology to be what led to the fall of the Demon Lord. So we can say our technology surpasses that of the dwarves. Izar looked at Bakugo with a longing gaze. My wish for humanity is to reach the point where we can focus on things we enjoy, where the machines do the rest. You know, cleaning and manual labor. At least the kind of manual labor you cannot be proud of. Simply let machines do it. That's my motto. Bakugo shrugged. Admirable, I guess. There was no honor in what Iza just said, but he understood. The scholars weren't physically capable. That's what they have proven many times to the barbarian. Bakugo, darling, said Iza with a faint smile. Can I ask you something? A scruff grunt came from the barbarian in affirmation. You must hate me, huh? I strongly dislike you. I mean, yeah, that would be a better way of putting it. Iza paused, then smiled gently. Good. Let's keep it that way. As Oleg said, my sister's in the inner sanctum. You can only enter it with a special code. I mean, I'm listening, said Baku in response. <laughs> Turn the numbers to zero, four, five. Then turn the four up twice so it becomes six and then back down to four. Then the five, you go down four times until it's one. And then you scroll it back up to five. <laughs> and then you turn the zero to a nine, back down to a five, back up to a nine, and finally back to a zero. Then you pull the lever. Ugh. I mean, yeah. Thanks. Growled Bakugo before standing up and leaving Zao alone on the bench. The necromancer smiled softly. Strongly dislike. Good. He muttered. It took Bakugu three attempts to enter the sanctum, and even then he was unsure of where he had landed. He had found himself in a large room. At its center stood a large, spiral staircase going straight up. The walls were covered entirely by shelves reaching so high they touched the ceiling, and they were filled with strange jars. Silence filled the area. Not even the flames of the torches seemed to give off any noise. Every step the Red King took echoed around him, giving him an oppressive feeling that was only supported by the sheer cold of the place. In fact, it was such a stark contrast to the foundry that it had given him whiplash, and he was seriously considering leaving this place until his eyes fell upon a figure that was quietly descending from the second floor. 
a red-robed figure. It was you. He inhaled to shout a greeting, but something about the air made him stop mid-noise. But it was enough to get your attention. You looked at him, face wet from tears, and approached him. Once you were right in front of him, he opened his mouth again. Concerned you might have been hurt, but quickly you leaned forward. Don't speak, you whispered. Not here. Quietly Bakugo followed you towards one of the shelves. Once again you leaned into him. This place is holy to us. Do not speak. I'll explain later. Being this close to the shelves, Bakugo could make out the contents of the jars. The glass containers themselves were bound by leather straps that then were attached to chains to the wood of the shelves. Inside was something pink and wrinkly. He made a surprised noise, only for it to be swallowed by the sanctum. You shot around, staring straight into his eyes. No noise. Got it. He gestured. Carefully, you began to remove the strap of one of the jars and lifted it into your arms, carrying it like a frail infant towards the barbarian. Quiet, but still loud enough for him to hear, you whispered. These are the shelves. One day I will join them. So will Isa. You leaned forward a bit so he could see better. Inside the jar was a well-preserved human brain. The barbarian put both hands in front of his mouth to not make a noise. He had seen a lot of his time here, but this was the last thing he expected. While he tried to process this information, you returned the brain back to its place. Before turning to the Red King. Upstairs is a table with chairs, you whispered. Come, don't be noisy. After sitting down opposite to you, he opened his mouth, doing his best to be as quiet as possible. What the fuck? was all he could say. Um, this goes a bit deeper. You know, we are afraid of death. I'm afraid of death. When a necromancer reaches the end of their lifespan, we put them on an operation and put their brain under these jars so that one day they come back, be it in an automaton of the Mechanicus or a zombie that has achieved true resurrection. Bakugo shrugged. Actually, you should have expected this. And why can't I talk? He whispered. This place is very delicate. It has been cursed. I mean, technically blessed. With a silent spell. Anything that reaches a certain volume is consumed into nothingness. Bakugo shrugged. Makes sense. Why are you crying? You whimpered. I come here often, you said, to see my family. Bakugo raised one hand to quiet you down. I, I understand. You smiled in response. Really? Bakugo leaned forward on the table so you could hear him better. This is very similar to our totems. Much more gross, admittedly, but... We have our halls of the dead. We place totems on corpses. The belief is that the totem creates a communication rift between the living and the dead. So you can tell your dead relatives how you're doing. It's a very humbling experience. You scratched over your chin. Interesting, you said. I would love to see it. Bakugo chuckled quietly. 
What? You said slightly amused by his demeanor, your sadness almost forgotten. Nothing, just... If you were to tell this to a shaman, they'd be offended. <laughs> Curious is the shaman's art. The brilliance only observed by the people already passed. You shrugged. I understand. You swiped away your tears with your right sleeve. Bakugo hadn't noticed it before, but your fingers were black, covered in chitin. And you noticed. Oh, this? You said and pulled the sleeve back. Your entire arm looked horrifying. It was as black as the deepest abyss. Red glowing veins moved across it. A blackened bandage was loosely wrapped around the lower half. It made noises similar to those of aching wood as you moved your fingers. I'm proud of it, you said. Unlike my brother. You pulled your rope back over it. They say a mage's arm is the representation of a sorcerer's actions, personality and power. I do wonder why mine is like this. I've never hurt anyone. Well, at least no one important. I, I do squash a few flies. They're gross, but I, I, I never killed someone, you know. Suddenly you felt really embarrassed. Now that you thought about it, maybe that's why your brother had such a complex about it. Bakugo on the other hand shook his head. It's fine. Um, I'm not, I hope I'm not hitting something sensitive, but what happened to your parents? He suppressed a tear. N not now. He nodded, accepting your answer. The two of you remained there, sitting quietly in the inner sanctum. As minutes turned into hours, Baku couldn't shake the feeling of having forgotten something. But maybe this wasn't important. At least you could share a moment with you. Meanwhile, Ijuro Kyushima, chieftain of the Nomad clan called the Silvas, was riding on his horned horse towards Almajik. Five of his guards close by. The Sun Elf could not wait to see his friend again. He was sure that the superstitions of the other tribesmen were just bollocks. Bakugo would never fall against some lousy undead and second-class wizards. But falling for one of them... That was something Kirishima did not see coming.